the Center for Innovative Technology, and Mach 37, Virginia Cyber Accelerator, present Uniting Women in Cyber, Leadership, Innovation, Inclusion. Well, I am here to introduce our next panel who is going to make their way out on stage while I tell you a little bit about the topic, which is the tone from top women building cyber ecosystems. Um, by the way, I'm Anita Antonucci, and I run uh, the airspace defense and business services practices over at Hulahan Loki around the corner. I want to start by asking how many of the women in this room have ever been in a professional meeting with more than five people in it that has this percentage of women? Anybody? Nobody. Oh, I see one hand, two hands. Okay, now I'm gonna ask the mirror question. How many women in this room have ever been in a professional meeting with more than five people where the percentage of men was roughly what we have here today? Mm, yeah, yeah. So although there are exceptions, I'm pretty sure that's true across just about every industry. And it's certainly the reason for the conference today is we know it is true in the cyber sector. But it starts at a very basic level. We have all gotten used to that being actually pretty normal. And not just in the cyber sector or this sector. Um, Gina Davis, who most of us know as Thelma in Thelma and Louise, did a study through her Institute on Gender in Media that said that not only are three, it is the ratio three to one of men to women in speaking parts in the media, generally TV, film, et cetera. The ratio is four to one men to women behind the scenes making media. And this is the one that really shocks me and most people. The ratio is actually f greater than five to one men to women in just your basic crowd scene in media. We are so used to that ratio that we look at a crowd of people and don't notice that that's not, that's not real. That's not the percentage of women and men in our world, but we're used to it. In a corporate setting, we're definitely used to it. The ratio of women on boards of directors has been stuck at just beneath 15% for decades. It's been totally stagnant since it reached that level, which was considered an accomplishment in North America. We all know there's some other countries that have addressed this issue through some pretty extreme in, uh, measures of quotas. But it goes beyond that. The topic today is inclusion. And Lenny said earlier that uh, diversity is not enough. Being in the room isn't enough. It's uh, about behaviors. Well, the statistics are equally uh, stunning that this is true in our society across the board. A good friend of mine, Aaron Reeves, is a PhD sociologist who did a study on what most of us learned uh, a name for during the 2016 campaign, uh, man-terrupting or mansplaining, right? <laughs> Vocabulary we're all pretty familiar with. I learned a new one the other day, by the way. Bro-propriating was new to me. <laughs> <laughs> but Aaron's study, uh, listened to panels like the one we have today and conference calls and in-person business meetings, a reasonably large subset, and statistically showed that men interrupt three times, tw excuse me, th twice as often in general. Men interrupt twice as often in general as women interrupt other people. Men interrupt women three times as often as they interrupt men. This is normal, we're all used to that. So many of the successful women I know, including a lot of you in this audience, work in what I'd call gender imbalanced industries. Notice I'm not using the common term male dominated. They are not dominating, they are outnumbering. Most of those women would say they didn't really think about these things. People say, why were you successful? I hope we're gonna hear some of those stories today. They didn't say, um, you know, I really tried to do this to combat the fact I was outnumbered. Most of them didn't think about it. They just worked hard. Um, maybe you had to work harder to be successful. How would you know? You were gonna work as hard as it took, not harder than the next person, just as hard as it took. So how is it that successful women can help address these imbalances that are 
it, uh, limiting inclusion of women in the dialogue, whether it's through interruptions or not being in the room. I hope that's what we're going to hear about from the topic today. Cyber is such a relatively new industry. I know the technologies and the threats have been around for a long time, but we have this wonderful chance to recreate the rules. And I love that Mary Beth and, uh, and uh, the group here have coined this term ecosystem or have adopted it for our use because that's what we're in the process of doing is making an ecosystem in cyber. And there is such a wonderful opportunity to be leaders on this subject. And I think that's the goal of today's uh, discussion is to set the tone for all of us as leaders on the subject of inclusion, learn the lessons from our really valuable panel today and try to take them home with us how we can be leaders. If you're an entrepreneur, you're a leader. If you're a uh, person in a room on a subject that you care about, I think Mary Beth is talking about in her panel later, it, you're a leader. So how is it that we, at the very beginning of the creation of this industry, can set the tone for inclusion? I hope we'll hear a lot of great things from this panel. Thank you, Anita. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Small, Director of Business Diversity for the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. The EDA is excited to be a part of this inaugural symposium, and I'd like to thank Ed and Mary Beth for putting together such a dynamic program. Fairfax has a robust cybersecurity ecosystem with more than 350 firms ranging from startups to Fortune 500 companies. Many of those companies are women-led or women-owned, so we're delighted to be a part of the conversation today that is occurring. So I'm especially delighted to share the stage with highly accomplished, successful women who could be considered trailblazers in this landscape called cybersecurity. While cybersecurity is a relatively young industry, it is an uncharted frontier that provides tremendous career opportunities. And while cybersecurity industry is ripe with opportunity, the industry, however, has a talent gap. It also has a major diversity gap. Why are there fewer women and minorities attracted to the industry? How do we make cybersecurity industry environment more receptive for everyone? Women make up more than 50% of the U.S. population and 59% of the U.S. labor force. So why is it only that 30% of women actively work in a technology-oriented industry and a mere 11% in the cybersecurity industry? Today's panel, Tone from the Top, Women Building Inclusive Cyber Ecosystems will take a look at the ecosystem from a workforce and entrepreneur perspective. Our panelists will discuss strategies on how we can move the needle forward to increase the number of women in the industry, as well as share their stories about their respective successful careers and what more can be done to encourage inclusion in the industry. And now I'd like to introduce the panel. Emily Fry of MITRE, Candace Charlton, of Amazon Web Services, Devon Smoyer of Reed Smith, and Karen Steeg of Booz Allen. So, ladies, from your perspective, how do you define inclusion and why is it important? And we'll just start with you, Emily. Okay. <clears throat> this is Anya. Yeah. Can you hear? I think inclusion is, is offering a warm welcome to all voices and uh, looking for content rather than presentation alone. Devon? I, I'd say the same thing, uh, except I would further define uh, the concept of, of inclusion by stating at the outset that diversity is differences. And it's not necessarily just gender differences, it's color differences, it's regional differences, it's different people with different abilities, whether you um, have uh, developmental dif disabilities, you have sight disabilities, or things like that. They're all um, very, very important to, um, particularly in the legal world, address um, some of the product development issues and the advice that we give with respect to pro product development and legal 
um, and compliance. And I, I do want to circle back and, and just say, I am so proud that the legal profession may be the one sector in this, e in this uh, ecosystem that is leading from behind because the, the stats are so depressing in cybersecurity that legal is actually looking great. So we'll circle back to that. But if you all don't want to do the computer science thing, you know, come be a lawyer. It's looking a lot better. Inclusion for me is, is really about creating that um, safe space by role modeling and giving people a way to be heard, um, regardless of you know, where they're coming from. Yeah, and for me, uh, similarly, it's about um, creating an environment where everyone knows that their opinions will be heard and will be considered. Um, and also, in a business context, the importance of it for me is about not losing track of the fact that we're not being diverse and inclusive just because it, it is a good thing to do, but also that it, um, it, it is the answer to the question uh, for a lot of businesses of how can we be more innovative, and that the answer is to be more diverse and more inclusive. Okay, all right, so starting with Emily, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to this place where you are currently today in your career? Sure, so um, I actually stumbled into this. I, when I left um, undergrad, I had a degree in history and econ, and I knew I wanted to be an editor, and I knew I wanted to be a judge. That was my statement about my life at that time. And I was an editor, and I very rapidly discovered that I have something to say, and I don't want to spend any more time working on polishing up what other people are saying. It's time for me to find a voice. So I went to law school with the intent of becoming a judge. And law school was hell. <laughs> it was the worst was experience nothing. of my life. So, so speaking for myself only, it was an awful experience. And what I discovered was in the third year, um, I had one credit left that was a, an elective if anything can rightfully be called an elective in such an awful situation. I, I elected to take this class called the Law of Electronic Commerce. Does anyone remember that term, electronic commerce? Yeah, that's what we called it back then, pre-email, pre-internet. Um, there was this thing called B2B transactions and ANSI X12 and all these standards by which you would conduct electronic commerce. And uh, at the time, all there was in, in the legal world was something called Reg E. And I heard this class met in a bar on Tuesday nights. Now, I don't really drink, but, you know, I needed to get that one credit out of the way, and I, I go and I sit in this class, and what I discovered was I came alive. I came alive because I wasn't in this class to learn the rules. I was in this class, and nobody knew the rules. And I was like... This is it. This, this is it. Okay, so I have done nothing else ever since. In one form or another, once I had found that zone, and over the years that zone has taken many forms. I have practiced law. I have run the research division of a think tank. I have served in management consulting. Um, I have taught, and I've had my own company. So um, now I'm at MITRE. I'm the director of national protection. And in every stage of that, it's always been how does the law interact with this thing that we now call cyber? And over the years, I've added in critical infrastructure because of the great dependencies that all of critical infrastructure and our homeland have on cyber. So it's like one flavor in many different forms. Chocolate can show up in any number of ways, but it's still chocolate. Uh, so my path, um, war story that may or may not be memorable um, at the end of the day. Um, I started out as a products liability litigator, and my first case was doing second chair deposition. Second chair <laughs> means you're supporting the main partner who's doing the very important ex expert or um, fact witness uh, information gathering. And the underlying dispute was over the efficacy of a penile implant. Okay, so I like to think that I've seen the whole panoply of the practice of law. So I don't do that anymore. Although I still represent that client now in privacy and, and other related things, which tells you if you stick with the client, you can get better work over the longer, longer <laughs> haul. Um, so my perspective on this and why I'm sort of trying to buck 
buck everybody up is at least in the practice of law, and you referenced it in cybersecurity and privacy, and I do a little more privacy than cybersecurity, is because it is such a new legal area and the laws are evolving so quickly and the regulatory regimes are so radically different um, within states, between continents, the European system is very different from the US system. There's really no leg up per se like there is in, or well-trod path like there is in antitrust or um, uh, corporate transactions and things like that. So there's really an opportunity, and I'm not saying there's parity among women and men at this point, but from my perspective, there are a lot more opportunities for women just because it's so open-ended and everything is in flux, so you really can rise and fall um, on your merits and based on what you know and your creativity. So, um, yeah, as I said, maybe, maybe the lawyers can lead from behind. The other thing I'll say, and I've been thinking about this over the last couple of weeks, I know we're talking about cyber, but cyber and privacy really go hand and glove. And what I've seen from the privacy perspective is, um, I don't have stats to back me up here, but what I've seen is radically different from what I'm reading in the reports. And I'm in no way suggesting that we should take the privacy stats to mask or a, be an apologist for the cyber stats. But what I am talking about is let's enlarge the room to find mentors, to find partners. And cyber is not that, diff that, not that different from privacy. So if we can expand our spheres of influence, why the heck not? <clears throat> So we like to ask the question a lot at Booz Allen, did cyber find you or did you find cyber? And um, I find myself in a, in a situation as a little bit of both. So I grew up um, as a recruiter. I did not go to school to be a recruiter and I don't think anybody does. Um, I just became a recruiter and it was my passion and still is. Um, and it was always in technology, but where that really took me was into all people programs. Um, and I was tapped at, at Booz Allen to really draw the connection because there is not enough people, um, or maybe there is, and we need to find a way to get them interested and developed in the space. And so it was really around the connectivity of the full talent life cycle from attracting to developing to deploying. Um, so I've been very fortunate um, at Booz Allen to really be able to draw those together. So again, whether I found it or it found me, um, it's a good place to be. Uh, I think we all kind of stumbled into uh, tech. I um, found my way, I was a business major in college and uh, midway through my junior year realized I was barreling towards graduation with, at probably the second worst time to be graduating with a degree in finance in our history. And I started looking around for ways to get um, job experience uh, prior to graduation, and IBM was on campus, and they were recruiting um, computer science majors. They historically had this internship program where that's all they recruited, and this one year that I went, they said, we're trying this new experiment. We want to talk to business majors because we think that you guys have probably have better communication and writing skills. We'd like to intermix you with some computer, computer science people. So I took a job at IBM working on computers, not having any clue um, anything about computers, nothing about technology at all. And, but that was the intent. And I really liked it, but I liked a different aspect of it than I had uh, anticipated. I was encouraged to go into, you know, maybe take some coding classes or things like that. But what I really, really liked was um, what I was working with was uh, customers and helping them to solve problems that they were working on. And I thought, you know, if this software had been built better, this wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> Um, and so I, I started off in, uh, on the testing side, the quality assurance side of testing the software, and I thought, well, by now, it's kind of a foregone conclusion. So I got involved with the, uh, what we called at the time requirements analysis and des user interface design and that kind of thing. Um, so I, that was what I really wanted to do, um, was just help solve the problems and create the solutions. And um, I got really involved with being in this uh, middle world between the uh, people who actually wanted to, um, they would have a problem, to, and then I would be the translator for the, um, the people who are actually doing the coding. And it was interesting to take them um, with me sometimes to these business meetings because they would come in and say, uh, the customers would always talk in their language and say, I want to 
computer, uh, an application that does this, that has these buttons. And then the program would just start trying to do it and come up with wire screens and, and, and show them what they could do. And I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're already implementing. What are you trying to actually do? What are you trying to solve? And that was just a completely different way for them to look at it. But that's, that's what I like doing. And then um, I did a number of years in defense contracting when I moved here to the um, DC area and found myself at, um, at AWS three and a half years ago in um, what was uh, probably the most diverse um, company I've worked for yet, um, having come from defense contracting, where I was uh, very often the um, only female in the room, um, and often the youngest, and I've gone the complete opposite now <laughs> <laughs> at, at um, AWS. So um, that's where I found myself in business development, specifically working with um, entrepreneurs um, to help them um, uh, design their solutions um, now. Okay. Thank you. So you've all taken this serendipitous route to get here today. Um, I'd like to change direction and talk about the companies for whom you work. More specifically, what are some of the strategies that MITRE, AWS, Reed Smith, and AWS, and B Booz Allen employ to attract women to the industry? Devon? So uh, my firm, uh, well, I'll tell you another war story. Um, <laughs> uh, I've, been in an, I've always been in the private practice of law. I have been in a variety of firms, so I've seen all kinds of bad behaviors and good behaviors and um, asymmetries and symmetries, uh, including a, a firm a number of years ago where I was the top gross, grossing uh, woman law partner, which was a completely frightening concept to me. Um, I'm like, are you serious? Um, so uh, Reed Smith has a number of um, professional development programs, like many law firms, for women. But I will say, um, I don't know exactly our statistics, but we have a senior management team that has gone over that tipping point, the tipping, the magic, the magic number tipping point for purposes of diversity and inclusion and role modeling. Um, and when I got to my firm, and I'm, you know, I'm now very firmly a middle-aged woman at this point, so I don't have mentors per se anymore. But when I met some of the women who um, had the biggest books, we call them books of business in the legal realm, and it is a business, so you're supposed to bring in money and you know you get paid according to that and prestige affords, it attaches to that. When I saw who, who had the biggest books, you would not necessarily know them by their demeanor, um, you would not necessarily know them by their gender, but some of the biggest, I guess I'd say in the top 10, there are at least four women with huge books of business. And for me to come from another law firm where I literally was the top grossing woman, again, which was frightening given that my stats at that point, um, was incredibly motivating. So I now um, use those women in particular not necessarily as mentors, but as co-promoters, because they found something that works, and it doesn't need to be the you know the typical I'm going to you know take your slice of business here or cut you a thousand different ways. It really is very um, uh, collaborative that way. So I, I guess what I'm saying, even into middle age and maybe upper middle age. Um, when you find those kinds of people as role models or, or who give you um, that extra bit of juice to go out and, and do what you want, it's, it's really meaningful. So that, um, that is trickled down in, into, into our firm, into you know, the more junior ranks. And like most law firms, there's still um, you know, room for improvement at the top in terms of percentages. But um, I've seen a radical transformation in the last 25 years since I've been practicing law, um, and particularly in the in the data security area. Um, sure. I'm sorry. Um, at AWS, we have um, initiatives. Uh, for instance, We Power Tech is our uh, diversity and inclusion marketing. Um, it's an initiative. It's a, there's a lot of programs. It's comprised of. Um, the goal of that is to build a pool of technologists who are familiar with our services, and and um, it. It can start at a very young age. Um, there's Girls Who Code, Code.org, Grace Hopper Institute, Ada, uh, Anita Borg Institute, and things like that. Um, but that's about seeding the pipeline of uh, uh, 
to recruiting actually at AWS, but also just um, having this pool of talent that will that will use the AWS services um, when they go out and uh, start their own companies or work for their own work their, for their own firms. Um, so another aspect of it is that's really ingrained in all of us is um, a lot of people have heard of the Amazon leadership principles, particularly when they were referenced in the shareholder letter last year that became more uh, mainstream, but some of those particularly reflect um, diversity and inclusion, um, like hiring and developing the best. That's one of our leadership principles, and that is about um, uh, making sure that you are bringing in perspectives from um, all backgrounds and being right a lot. That's one of our leadership principles, and that means considering diverse opinions and uh, making sure that you're consider considering everything. Um, that's uh, you know some of the ways that we're just making sure that it's not just um, you know seeding the pipeline of talent, but also keeping the talent and keeping that culture um, within within AWS. So we believe at Booz Allen, um, and you you know if you know us, you may have heard this is that cyber takes a village, and that is really adopted in many of the practices and how we push it forward. So. Specifically, we have um, external and internal facing initiatives. Um, many of those cross over and intersect, which is, is the right thing. From an external perspective, we are um, engaged heavily with um, outside organizations like Executives Women's Forum, Women of Cyber Jitsu. We were talking earlier, I know, about um, the, all of the women in STEM type of organizations and how we need to all come together. Um, but just really getting involved and having a presence with those. In fact, um, for a couple years in a, in a row now, we have um, hosted at University of Maryland, for instance, a, a women capture the flag team, and we're getting ready to partner with um, women of Cyber Gypsu with one in, in April. And then internally, we have our women in cyber. Um, we have a women's agenda across the firm, but women in cyber is a is a more uh, new initiative and. I see Kristen up there. All Kristen's of all of us. That's right, the entire team up there. Um, it's 300 strong, but it's really about um, attracting, developing, and advancing women in cyber. And we do a lot, like I said, it takes a village. I mean, we're reaching out. It's not just technical people. I mean, it's privacy. Um, there's so many intersections. We want to make sure that, that the women understand that um, across the board. And then we also have started what we call our talent ambassadors which is really people internally within the firm, from our learning platforms, um, from the business. I mean, really people who are her standing up and taking an active role and an active voice in how we engage people across the firm um, in those initiatives. So I would say that at MITRE, um, the effort to be more inclusive and deliberately diverse was launched by the Officer Corps 10 years ago. Last summer, they took a hard look at what they had accomplished. They liked some of what they saw. They didn't like all of what they saw, and they relaunched. So I would say there's a, a continuous, um, intentional approach to examining who we are, what we do, and are we doing enough? At the moment, I, the way I tend to think about inclusion or women in leadership is that a corporation has the responsibility to set a tone. And then each of us who work in that corporation we each have a responsibility as well to set a tone and to take certain specific actions personally. So what has MITRE done to set the tone? If you look across the officer corps, there's such a range of people that any woman who seeks to go very, very high can easily see that that's possible, right? So the, so the most senior figures in the corporation, the general counsel, the head of HR, the chief of staff, which is an incredibly powerful position at MITRE, these are all women. Uh, the VP for intelligence, woman. So there's no um, reason that you would look at the corporation and say, uh, that's a place where I don't belong, that's a place where I can't excel. Instead, you look at the leadership and you say, they're setting a tone here, and clearly it's on purpose, because those communities, such as intelligence and defense, aren't natively woman-dominated. It's just, you know, statistically. So there's that, and then there are these other things that are pervasive. So you can do things that are token gestures, and it doesn't pervade the organization. And then you can take, the, take it deeper, and that's what they're doing now. Um, and I've been so grateful for this. There's this atmosphere of senior women going out and intentionally finding other women that they can connect with, and younger women or more junior women 
to offer them guidance and help, coaching and leadership. This is both formal and informal. Many of you may have seen the research that formal mentoring programs are actually not particularly successful on average compared with organic connections between people. So obviously I think there's a lot of value in saying we stand for mentoring, we're gonna do it, but the way that chemistry happens between people is actually, there's some organic elements to that. So when you see actual women who are not following a, a, a structured mentoring program, but who are going out to, to find other women with talent and to say, I'm here for you and I'm gonna help you, that's that sort of organic component that creates the tone, not just at the leadership level, but throughout the variety of the levels and the functions across the corporation. So it's great to see that all of the companies have great initiatives. Karen, as the lone HR representative here today, has BAH altered the job descriptions, the way they're written, and the websites and talent recruitment collateral? And has that made a difference? So I think there's a lot to that. And not, it's, it's not just about changing um, our, our job descriptions. And I'm glad you referenced the other items as well. It's really about how we show up in, in cyber. Um, we, we recognize that the language of our descriptions, and we have to, I'm a government subcontractor, so we have to, you know, get away from taking LCATs and kind of cut, cutting and pasting them. Um, because a lot, we know a lot of our cyber talent doesn't necessarily maybe link directly to those. So how we attract people, how we gain excitement about the mission, back to that, that storytelling theme, um, is super important for us. And so that's how we're picking up our job requisitions, is really getting people excited to work in the space of cyber. Um, we are also really very focused on how we are talking to our military communities and making sure, you know, back to the fundamental, let's all talk the same language when it comes to cyber. So really defining what our capabilities and um, experiences are needed across the talent spectrum, but also translating that so our veteran community and our military community recognize that um, in their language. And so that's another initiative that we have taken on. And then just how we market ourselves, and we are putting front and center um, our women. We have many, many um, very successful cyber women across lots of different space, not just te technical, but also those um, other skills like privacy and policy and, and that. And we're putting them out there front and center, not just through our our web pages, but you know, in speaking engagements and things like that. Okay, thank you. So, with the exception of Devon, um, where you sit, most of the numbers for women in cyber, with women and minorities, are dismal. How do we go about changing this? So I'm going to I'm going to bring up part two of what I had started when I said the company has an obligation to set the tone and then to embody the tone through action. Um, there are certainly efforts that many companies exert to show up <coughs> at recruitment fairs and to reach out to diverse communities to recruit. Um, I think that the most effective things we can do are actually personal in nature. Um, and those involve, uh, let me talk to you about my colleague Rosie Pridemore. So Rosie spends weekends throughout the year coaching elementary and middle school students in teams for Odyssey of the Mind. So how do you become a person who is an example in the community building young communities of girls and diverse minorities into places where they're on an effective playing field with all kinds of other people from a very young age, giving them the power to become whatever they want to be. So those kinds of personal connections have repercussions throughout the lives of those impacted. Um, within the company, we have a tremendous amount of technical talent, and our technical talent is incredibly diverse. So I want to tell you a story. We have a new vice president of all civilian programs right now, and it's a woman. And one of the first things she said to all of us who lead portfolios, I have a portfolio called the National Protection Division. And she met with all of us within her first month, and she said, what I want you to do is I want you to go out and find those people who are being ignored, who are tremendously talented, and I want you to look for diversity. You find those people, and you offer them, you offer yourself to them. 
And if you're not a good fit for them, chemically, you go find someone who's a good fit for them. You make sure that they have what they need to succeed and to thrive. So it's a combination of people being out in the community, and MITRE supports that. We offer something called sea time for doing civic duty around and about the community as it pertains to STEM and diversity. It's also a matter of personal commitment, and again, it's coming from the top, that encouragement and blessing. But if you're programmed to do it, you know you have top cover to do that, to find those people who, who don't look like you, they don't sound like you, and, and you see their talent, and you're, you be there for them. So I think that's one aspect of it. I'm sure others have answers that are different. Mm -hmm. Can I still talk on this, even though I was? <laughs> okay, so um, separate and apart from Reed Smith, I've just been I've been thinking about this issue more generally in terms of tools or potential tools from the United States, the state, the states, um, Europe. So I'm not necessarily endorsing all of them. Some are definitely stick driven, and a couple of them are carrot driven. One I I just found out about, which I I think is is incredibly interesting. So um, I know there's gonna be a discussion a little bit later about board composition, but um, the EU is, is moving toward a mandatory board um, composition of 40% women. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily gonna be embraced um, on a large scale in the United States, but it's out there and it's um, highlighted as important. Um, in the United States, and I think this is a much, much easier sell, and in, in fact, it's de facto the law in, in a number, increasing number of jurisdictions. In California, Delaware, Oregon, Massachusetts, Puerto Rico, New York City, Philadelphia, and San Francisco, in the course of job interviews, you're not allowed to ask about current salary. Um, and that's already the law. We're gonna see how quickly that's gonna spread to other states and how that's going to change um, the employment practices and law and in other areas. And some of these are, um, these, some of these are, are asserted cures to a market failure, and we do have a market failure. So I think some of these ideas um, really should be embraced. I will tell you from the legal perspective, um, when companies um, put out contracts for bids and say we want this, uh, this kind of person or this this uh, our, our panel to reflect this kind of diversity it is heard loud and clear um, so if you think that it's not let me tell you from the inside 25 years of law practice it absolutely is um, and it's probably the same thing in terms of government contractors too um, in the, in the UK law firms are supposed to report pay gaps between men and women at a variety of levels and a lot of law firms are now reporting pay gaps at, um, at some of the levels that are not required. That's not the case in the United States, but it's out there as a potential tool for consideration or best practices. Um, and then the most interesting um, thing that's specific to lawyers at this point, but I thought was very interesting carrot, was I was over at the George Mason Law School earlier this week and they have launched a special certificate for lawyers um, uh, in the area of um, diversity and inclusion, which I had never heard of before and could be a major differentiator in terms of um, lawyers seeking to promote and get better positions and distinguish themselves among their colleagues and also legal departments to their clients. So there's a lot of creative stuff going out there, going on out there. All right, thank you. So where did the time go? We have just exceeded the amount of time, but if I may, one last comment for each of you, a lightning round. What is your advice to women to encourage them to want to get into the cybersecurity industry? And just a quick lightning round. Stay curious. Uh, stick to your guns, don't be cowed. Don't go alone. Yeah, and uh, you know, I would say that it's, there's, uh, it's never too late. Um, I mean, that's a, it's a, just a really broad category um, that I, I never thought I would wind up in. <laughs> Thank you. So the topic of inclusion, as you can see, is quite an interesting one. Thank you for your time, and let's give our panelists a round of applause.